So thanks very much to our, our four panelists. They've really offered um, um, a rich and thought-provoking set of remarks. And I have a lot of questions, but I'm sure you do too. And so um, we don't have a huge amount of time. We have about 15 minutes, and we can at least start a discussion and maybe continue over lunch. But I'll let me turn it over now to the audience and collect a few questions. Um, and please, a question, not a, not a monologue, not a comment. Um, and please start by introducing yourself. Is anybody? Please, yes, in the front. Yeah, um, my name is Daryl Sequera, and I'm an environmental ecologist uh, based in Finland. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a very important part of the meeting uh, with Wider. Um, and um, my proposal is that one way to get around this problem is to create a framework which shall be observed when dealing with planning of projects, etc. Now, uh, I've noticed that in this situation here, uh, there are no environmentalists, per se, like an ecologist, for example. Mm -hmm. There are politicians, sociologists, and so on, which are related, perhaps, but no real environmentalists. But the fact is that um, over a period of these more than 30 years, actually, there has been the, um, the, the intention and the success of bringing in, for example, environmental impact assessment into projects in its planning stage and evaluation stage and implementation stage as well. Uh, and it has been fairly successful. I myself have been involved in bringing about this kind of change in the thinking in the development aid agencies and to a small extent even in wider in the past. The current management of wider don't seem to be so interested in environment, you know. They think, they some seem to adopt the attitude that natural resources are infinite and we can just grab it where we like and dispose of it, you see. We do have current but work maybe on I'm exaggerating. Resources. I'm exaggerating just to create some um, polarization, shall we say. <laughs> uh, the other, uh, that's one question. The other aspect is that they sh we should prevent abuse of this multidisciplinarity. Okay. Uh, whereby uh, I have been, for example, when I worked in China, um, there was a political scientist I don't know how good she was really as a, in her subject, but she was put on committees where she made decisions concerning biodiversity conservation, which were very ecological in nature, those kind of decisions, not political at all, mm -hmm. but a more, more kind of biological type, you know. Then I once did a consultancy for the World Bank, and they told me to look for rare species of bird in the <laughs> jungle in the middle of Tanzania in about two days. <laughs> okay. Now, because who was telling you to do that? An eco economist yeah. with I'm no sorry. idea about biology. <laughs> so we should avoid abuse, you know, of the position of people in these kind of committees whereby they try and pronounce on things they don't know much about. And okay. that also reflects on what economists pronounce upon. Yep. They very often make blunders when it comes to the real problems of implementing economic policies in the society and in the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, and I won't elaborate on that, but I could. Okay, thanks. So I think that gives our statement. panelists a lot to comment on. Um, let me catch a couple more questions, and then I'll turn back to our panelists to respond. Yes, in the, the middle, with the red scarf. Well, thank you very much. I'm Sarah Quirney uh, from the University of Sussex, Brighton. Um, thank you for the thoughts you have shared this morning. Um, but a few questions come to mind, particularly for an early career researcher like me. I am very much conscious of um, the criteria by which my career pro pro uh, progression is uh, determined. And a lot of it is based on being able to publish in uh, journals that are recognized by economists as, you know, high ranking. How would one marry this with... Um, Conducting multidisciplinary work, um, if, you know, these are not based purely on economic methods and therefore one might not be able to gain access or be able to have one's article published in some of these um, 
journals that are uh, recognized by the profession. Thank you. Thanks. Um, there was a question in the front here, the woman with the, yeah. Thank you, Vivan Stolen from Finland. Uh, way back, I was an assistant uh, in labor law and um, economic relations at the University of Turku. So I am a lawyer and I was very, very pleased with, with all this, uh, what you have been telling about working life because I think that's extremely important. When I was uh, combining then labor law and economic relations, I realized that there was no connection whatsoever at a legal level between these. And of course, they're, they're the two sides of the same coin. And after that, I have been struggling also with the mental barriers that are created by, by our legal uh, doctrines. So now <clears throat> I am uh, uh, researching work that is done between an employment and business. And the problem is with labor law and, and the legal st or supportive structures, they only cover work that is done in an employment relationship. So that captures the notion of law and what is done outside is mostly invisible. And now I am an in independent researcher, so my work is also in that respect uh, uh, invisible. But I have been focusing on on the work of artists, because that's a profession that you, you have been training for years in order to, to perform a work and you have to struggle like hell in order to be able to do it. So that means that the social structures are not, uh, are not catered for artistic work. And at the same time, it, it, this is uh, uh, an economic field that is growing and is flowering where industry and so on goes down. And then also the work that is done in household and in civil society. So I have been very, very pleased also with the work that uh, Stieglitz has been doing on, on civil society and households. So I, I would like to just uh, bring these questions also to your research agendas. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, here behind you, Hans. Thank you. Uh, David Stifel, uh, Lafayette College in the United States. Um, I, I'd like the panelists to just uh, comment, if you will, on, um, on the kind of the difference, the difference that I distinguish between multidisciplinary work and interdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in our college, for example, and a lot of undergraduate institutions in the States, there's a lot more programming uh, majors in interdisciplinary uh, work. Um, and um, the, our tendency is to get your PhD in a particular discipline, though there are some interdisciplinary uh, graduate programs, um, some of these masters of, of development practice type programs that are emerging these days. Um, but perhaps it, kind of what Danielle was talking about with the different the depth versus the breadth uh, uh, challenge. I'm just curious on, on your thoughts about this. Uh, breaking down the barriers if indeed we don't have our silos so much uh, at that PhD level. What are we giving up, uh, if you will, and is, is that the way we should go? Thanks. Great. We have time for one more quick question. Okay, the gentleman in, oh, the gentleman in the back. I'm not sure I'm a gentleman. But... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. I enjoyed the uh, reflection very much. Uh, I'm wondering about the, um, the attention to to language and concepts, which emerges out of the uh, out of out of your your experiences, and 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 Harum, I think your 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 story about how you your your interest or your concern moves from from uh, the uh, strength of unions or labor market rigidities to legislative frameworks to the embedded of the judici embeddedness of the ju judiciary in in a particular context is, is extremely interesting because we see that not only the concepts are changing, but also the problem is changing. And it's becoming, and it's becoming, uh, very, and, and in a way, um, it seems to me that you, 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 you abandon the, your, your initial framework completely and, and you have to adapt to a completely new way of thinking about the situation. And, and I think that that's what's, that is the real value of, of, of multidisciplinarity, is that you find new questions 
starting to emerge in the, in the interaction of people of different epistemic communities, if you like, that there's, there's oh, completely, it's not, nobody is studying what they initially thought that they would study. And I was just wondering, it's not really a question, but since you asked for questions that could, do you have <laughs> other examples of, of new questions which emerged out of these, out of these kinds of, uh, of collu collaborations or collisions? Thank you. Great. Oh, I'm, my name is Jeremy Gould. I, at the University of U.S. Good, thank you. Um, so we have five questions slash comments uh, for the panelists to respond to. Um, please feel free to respond to whichever you want to. Um, and maybe we, we go in order of, of presentation. And we've, we have lunch. It's lunchtime now. So if I ask you to speak for a couple minutes each so we don't keep people from lunch. Rachel, excuse me, could I, uh, when I was <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, Arun, you should ask you. Uh, Roger has spoken. Um, so I, because of the time limit, I'll just run through a few of the questions. I mean, some of them were very clearly uh, linked to comments, say, Danielle or Michael made. Uh, wrapping them together, I think on career progression and maybe David's inter versus multidisciplinary approach, I mean, typically, I've just driven, drawn a graph, right, <laughs> of what would happen over, uh, over one's career. And I think purely for uh, personal utility functions or the way the, the industry is structured or the way uh, you're looking at career progression, uh, early on it makes sense to specialize and publish in those journals where the returns are going to ensure that you get tenure or whatever. I mean, and, and that's, I think, a really difficult thing to argue against. I think you'll find, and it's probably true of, of uh, people we know, Gary Fields, uh, Ravi Kanbur, others that at least I know, um, who've, um, who've over time, once they've established their reputation, started to stretch their wings. And um, maybe to extend your metaphor, remain Hindus, but Hindus who take communion, right? So it's that sort of, uh, so, so you're willing, to, you're willing to, to live in other worlds, but I think, and perhaps it's, it's my own sort of personal preference is to remain rooted in, uh, in your original discipline. I just think that, because that's where you can add value. That's where your comparative advantage may lie. Um, uh, and just, a, just another point about, you know, there is on the law and economics uh, work, there is a huge amount, as you know, of uh, uh, work that's going on within the ILO, but I think less successfully that's drawn economists in. I think it is a really, really difficult bridge that, and even in competition law and economics, but I think there is interesting work. I think in the developing uh, world, you do find straddling between, you know, when a merger case uh, is taken to court by, by, by the law fraternity, there's an economist next to them, right? Uh, that, that tries to be helpful. So. I think in, in many cases, uh, uh, maybe there is a selection bias, but, uh, but I, think in many, I think you have fundamentalist Hindus and fundamentalist Catholics, right? Yeah. And, and the hope is that we can all together find a space where, where those that are willing to be diverse can, can believe in uh, reincarnation, but also take communion. <laughs> I'm very confused now. <laughs> Not really. I would like to, it, it kind of follows on, thank you. Rachel, with, from, from what Tarun saying, and pick up on something, it wasn't a response to a direct question, but very strongly feeling, partly as a result of your question, this, we can talk about multidisciplinarity or practice interdisciplinarity and whatnot, but as the scholars themselves or the principal investigators um, get more senior, they're less likely to go out into the field. And either your own students or the field workers who are employed don't yet have, either the, 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 the students who are still doing their graduate work, they're going to be properly committed to their discipline in a more narrow frame. Um, and then a contracted and field workers in the field um, aren't going to really know possibly what you're talking about when you say, when you're trying to supervise and manage and say, this is what this question means. And I've been very interested in South African rural work on the income dynamic study about an extremely sophisticated Zulu-speaking research team that I had, none of, of whom had first degrees, but all had a lot of experience as field workers. Um, 
spotted things that I could never have spotted. And I'm not just talking about in a language way, but also started interpreting things according to own cultural norms. And I use that word with great reservation, but started, picked up much more on the depth to which superstition controls a lot of theories of explanation in some of those r rural communities. I'm being very careful in the way I say it now, but also themselves were interpreting at the, according to some, what I would call superstition. So a person, we went into a household and there was a hydrocephalic child in there. And we got back to debrief at the end of the day and that child had been bewitched. And I was trying to say, well, no, there is this thing called hydrocephaly. You, you operating in any way, I think this is the point, sorry, that in interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary work, you, you're working any way with your own precepts and your own languages and your own anger and your own sense of being disparaged and, and whatnot. But now to take that two or three steps down the research track, chain and to try and deal with those different interpretations of the world, I think is very hard to do. Very hard to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, well, thanks for your comments and observations. Um, I think, you know, this, this issue, as Sarah, Sarah brought up about the, the publications, I mean, something I was, was trying to articulate with this kind of idea of having a two-pronged strategy. And I think, I mean, we often do it. I often have to write donor reports, and then you have to think about how can I spin this to then get a journal article out of it. I mean, we, we're often doing it kind of within our disciplines. Um, but I think, I mean, one of the things I've, I've found is most useful is finding a partner in crime um, from another field um, who's really interested in a similar topic mm -hmm. as you, but brings, you know, maybe brings the different method or the different theory. Um, so I've been working a lot on political economy of agricultural subsidies and working with, with an ag economist who's methodologically much much sharper than I am, um, but I can contribute the kind of theoretical background and, and the framing of the question. So um, I think, yeah, finding, you know, within your kind of thematic interest, uh, finding kind of a partner in crime. Um, I think on the um, kind of interdisciplinary programs, I mean, I think what you sacrifice is the methods at the end of the day, because, uh, you know, I think as anthropologists, you learn how to do kind of great ethnographic Work. And of course, you know, you learn your kind of econometrics or your general equilibrium modeling in your economics program and kind of really good comparative case study work as political scientists. Um, and so I think that is something you sacrifice. And I'm, I'm saying this as someone who did, I did my master's work in development studies and felt I theoretically got a good feel for a lot of different issues, but at the end of the day, uh, kind of had a, a weak methods uh, toolkit. And I think as long as the, the kind of job market remains kind of siloed, you know, they look for kind of an urban specialist or, you know, a public administration specialist or, you know, economists, whatnot. Um, I think as long as that remains siloed, it, it's quite difficult to, to get kind of students um, kind of excited and kind of interdisciplinary work and uh, make them feel like they're, they're equipped um, adequately. And I guess lastly on Jeremy's question about new observations from collaboration, um, just one thing that struck me from our African youth work um, was that there's kind of a lot of stuff in the, the kind of public, public policy community and African Development Bank, World Bank as well about pushing towards kind of vocational education and you know that, that curriculums in, in Africa are outdated and they're focused on the wrong issues and not equipping people for the skills market. When we brought in an education specialist uh, who worked, who's from Kenya, he did this amazing kind of historical overview of vocational education showing this has been going on for a long time and the impacts even in, even in Europe um, of vocational education really, really haven't uh, been, been <laughs> very impressive. Um, so it kind of changed my own thinking in terms of policy prescriptions on, on African youth. <laughs> um. When I f finished my PhD, I had the choice of being the token development guy in a sociology department or being the token sociologist in a development department. And so the choice was, for me, I guess, came down to what epistemic community do I want to join? Who are my people? <laughs> um, I decided I cared about development way more than I cared about sociology. 
Uh, sociology was a means to an end. I suffered the indignities of a PhD because you know, I wanted to hang out with other sociologists because I actually wanted to try and do this idealistic thing of change the world. And uh, that choice then meant that um, uh, I did, uh, by choosing to put myself into as the Hindu amongst the Catholics, I just, <laughs> said, uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to wager, I'm going to back that I can, I will learn so much more by hanging out with, not just with other economists, but by, with operational people in the bank, like getting a real phenomenological, real-time sense of what big projects, big politics, ugly politics looks like and feels like when you're part of it, as opposed to sniping about it from the sidelines. I said, I'm going to wager that I will do better sociology, actually, if I'm willing to deal with the craziness and the uncertainty of that, than if I just hole up in a, a nice leafy college somewhere and think about all this stuff. <laughs> so that was my choice, right? And reasonable people can choose entirely differently about how they choose to go forward. And, and I was a white guy from Australia trying to cut at international development and even being to a developing country when I decided I wanted to do this sort of stuff. I, the learning curve that I was self-consciously uh, so far behind on meant that I had to, I was just, I said, I am, I will not be taken credibly and taken seriously in this field. I won't have credibility to function unless I'm willing to uh, do all the things that one needs to do to actually get a better handle on this field. So all of which is to say, <laughs> I think if in your early part of your career, you're going to really have a pretty honest inventory of sort of what your what sort of trajectory you want to be on. If you want to, if your if your people, if you get your rush out of hanging out at the annual meetings of the American Political Science Association, those are your tribe. That's the people you bond with and you love hanging out with. Then you do what you got to do to be respected by that little tribe. Um, uh, as it happens, I've gone on to win the, the, the best article and best pro book prize from the American Sociological Association for work that I, that I did in development, but could never have done that if I hadn't been sitting where I sit, surrounded by these super smart, wonderful economists who remind me on an hourly basis what I don't know, um, and who, and even more so, we're hanging out with operational people who run real projects in real countries with real governments with real problems and real budget constraints, who, again, just know vastly more than I ever will about how to actually turn these ideas into things that can be funded, that can be politically supported. And you know, So I think a lot of it, can, it really comes down to who, who, who are your people? <laughs> who are you trying to, who, who do you want to be respected by and who do you think you can actually make a contribution to? And then ultimately, whether it's in an academic, academic setting or not, you've just got to wager in effect that... Um, the contribution that you have and that you've trained your life for when it's added into the mix and combined with that of other people, that something good will happen. But I think pragmatically in my, in my, my slice of experience of all this, if you, you get animated by an important problem and you'll get, you will wager that you'll get recognized by the profession and by practitioners as, as well, when you actually make inroads onto a problem that the world cares about and, ever refined tweakings of models is, is there's a niche 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 part of the of the epistemic community that'll reward you for that but i think to justify these nice conferences <laughs> to uh to justify getting nice salaries from the world bank you ultimately the the the, the, the only real justification for me is that we <laughs> have a religious conviction that knowledge somehow really does matter and that it can contribute to slight improvements in the quality of our thinking and our doing and our assessing in development and uh, to do that well you've got to just be willing to uh, recognize that we are we have the luxury of having the career we do because of the because of the institutional framings that allow us to have these kind of conferences and um, so to me ethically <laughs> uh, starting from a, a really key problem and then figuring out how to bolt your skills onto the skills of other people take division of labor seriously uh, that's how good stuff happens in the world Great, thanks. Um, so this is fun. <laughs> and I have the hard task of, of cutting off the conversation. Um, maybe you can continue over lunch. I'm sure you have a lot more to, um, the panelists have provided a lot of food for thought and I really thank them for their, their remarks. Um, it's been really interesting for me. Thank you.